will do my best to monitor that. Awesome. All right, so what we're going to be talking about today is uh, Stanford Sites Drupal 8. This is the new uh, centrally managed content management system at Stanford University, built and managed by the Stanford Web Services team. Uh, we just rolled out version one of our Drupal 8 version. Yeah, it took us a little while to get to Drupal 8 here at Stanford, <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, but we just rolled that out at the end of February, and who knew that at the end of March it would be playing such a big role. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we were aiming for in the first release of that service. We're going to cover how to write good structured web contents. We're going to kind of transition from talking about the platform to talking about how to build a great website, whether you're on our platform or on really any platform and building a website. We're going to talk about uh, how to structure good content, how to publish structured content. We're not going to talk about a advanced HTML or design, um, sort of how to organize your content or coding HTML. This is meant to be a, a high level sharing and story time about how we built the service and then some of our best practices and building sites uh, on that service or elsewhere. So I'm curious if we can kind of, this might be hard with 43 participants, but maybe popcorn out a little bit about where people are from and um, what kinds of jobs you're in. And that way we can maybe tailor a little bit of your talk, of our talk to what you might be interested in. Does anybody want to practice using the raise hand function and share more? I can see some names, so I can just start randomly calling on people too, which is an even better thing than being in person. I wouldn't know your names. I'd be like, guy in purple. Hey, Allie, I saw your hand. Hi, um, I'm the Website Operations Manager at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, so I work awesome. with, um, we call them web authors, but we work with web authors around the school um, to maintain their content on the site. Awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us, Allie. Nice to be here. Anybody else? I also see somebody named Bernardo Martinez. Yeah, I am actually a web developer for University of Tennessee Chattanooga. Awesome. Wow, how great to have you. Thanks for joining us. How about Stephanie Dudley? You just popped up on my screen. You're like a lottery winner. I actually work with um, Allie and Jenny, Jenny Hutchinson. I'm on their team and um, I'm not fully involved in Drupal 8 yet but um, I want to find out about it and see what it's about so that I can do whatever I can to help uh, Jenny and Allie. That's awesome. Well, fantastic. GSB is representing at WebCamp Woo this year. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw hands on Rachel Hupp too. Is she just clapping? Are you clapping? You're like, yeah, GSB. All right, she's clapping. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody for um, being willing to, to get called on. So that's our agenda today. I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, Drupal 8 story time. So Stanford Sites has been around as long as my team has been around at Stanford. We were uh, formed in fall of 2011. We were a small but mighty team of five in the beginning, and we created this platform with some friends in University IT. Uh, and it now has over 2,000 Drupal 7 websites on it. Um, so the thing kind of grew and grew and certainly got more sites on it than we ever thought that it would. And when Drupal 8 came out, we suddenly realized, oh, hmm, yeah, we're going to have to rebuild all of those. And that's a not great part about Drupal 7. Uh, you know, Drupal 7 to 8 is a big shift. It requires rebuilding. So with Drupal 7, uh, that's, so we've been putting it off. We're like, uh, you know, yeah, we'll get to it. Um, but Drupal 7 end of life by November 2021, we need a pretty ambitious um, plan to get all of those websites that need to remain alive from one version to the next. And thank goodness with Drupal 8 moving forward, these big shifts won't be necessary anymore. The, the open source community got really smart. They put a lot of work into building it in a way that future upgrades are done in place. So this is the last time we have to do it. That also means it's our last chance to really get it right. Right. So we set an ambitious goal to move to Drupal 8 before November 2021 and to help all of those site owners adopt that new service because we certainly aren't going to get in there and touch all 2000 websites. The last thing you want to do is take a bad website and move it into a new version, but it's still a bad website. You want to take this as an opportunity to redo it and rethink it and uh, maybe your business goals for your organization have changed. So it's time to redo it. Um, so 
the move from seven to eight is a really big shift, but the application itself is better. It's very different. It's different both at a code level and from a usability level for the, uh, for the editors. And it requires rethinking and rebuilding your site, relearning the tool. And that's a pain or it's an opportunity, <laughs> right? So we decided to see it as an opportunity uh, to build a better product really from the start. So let's go to the next slide. What's, our goal with the new Drupal 8 service was to start with something that was really simple and easy to use. 54% uh, of the department and group websites on Stanford Sites Drupal 7 have fewer than 50 nodes. They're really small. They're like 50 nodes and one content type. So it really tells us it's a self-service. It's uh, most of the site owners there are very um, building very basic sites. They just need to get content on a page. And that's the clean way of saying that. So theoretically, if we get this right and site owners can adopt it on their own, we're halfway to the finish line because 50% or 54% of our site owners can adopt it. So our version one focuses on usability. It focuses on uh, the accessibility of the products that we're putting out so that the end result uh, website is something that users of all abilities can equally navigate and, and read. Uh, and it focuses on security because we don't want to put something out there that we've then got um, 2,000 websites with security issues. So that's really at the heart and soul of what we're doing. So version one is going to focus on usability, accessibility, and security, and it aims to meet just the needs of those site owners who need a simple site with the right branding, Stanford University, because that's where we are, and basic static content, but it has to look good. So that's what we aimed for. The feature set, um, the key features included in version one are single sign-on, that's going to be using the Stanford ID with user roles and permissions built in. We want that to be really simple from the beginning. We have pretty locked down permissions from the beginning. Again, that's part of security. We're building a really great self-service tool, but we're not gonna give you lots of power tools because with power tools comes the ability to break things. And again, our whole, um, our whole mission right off the, the bat is security, right? So keep hammering that, that drum. So single sign-on with user roles and permissions, some super cool drag and drop functionality. We worked really hard to make it usable and drag and drop is highly usable. People really get how to move things from one side to the next. I think it's all those video games that we played when we were kids. Um, so give them the ability to build engaging layouts in really simple ways. And we use the decanter design system. This is something we've talked about at previous camps. It's uh, Stanford's design and development system so those patterns and styles are built right in and the resulting website looks really good and looks like Stanford and that's that's the whole point is these basic sites are generally groups at Stanford and they benefit from the main university identity. So we're building the most flexible and inclusive platform that we've ever built with a modern design that's based on Stanford.edu. So now I'm going to turn it over I forget if I'm turning it over to uh, Allison or Cynthia. I'm gonna turn it over to somebody. It might be Allison. Uh, it's, it's me. Um, so my name, my name is Allison. I'm a web project manager at Web Services. And so I was gonna show a few of the awesome things that people are making um, with our product. Um, so the first site is um, Nano at Stanford. And I actually believe that the site owner is here um, in this session. Um, and um, so I'm going to click in here, but I like to show a before and after so you can see our uh, product in action and what um, a lot of our uh, users were maybe maybe what their website looked previously like before. Um, so this is the Nano Lab site and I'm going to it's going to click out um, here. So um, this is a pretty a standard site with static content on here. And um, one thing that our site owner um, did really, really awesomely is um, prepped with uh, some photography before Linda Cicero retired. And so as you can see, our theme is uh, really heavily dependent on beautiful imagery. And I think that really makes sort of the, um, the aesthetic of the site here. So um, I believe her name, um, Angela, is there anything that you want to say or anything about your site? Um, it looks great. I'm still learning to build some of the functions and things like that. So, um, that is, uh, uh still sort of a learning curve because I had been really 
or somewhat familiar with Drupal 7. Actually, Shannon Krasa, who I think is also on the call, had been helping us on some other project. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely much easier from um, Drupal 7, but I think I'm still figuring things out. Awesome. Thank you for jumping in. I just called on you like it was not planned. <laughs> so um, the next site is, um, let's see, is um, it's actually a prototype site that we're doing um, with the Stanford Alumni Association. Um, so this is the previous Stanford Sierra camp. And uh, I wanted to include this one too because it's a little bit bigger um, in terms of number of pages within the site. And as you can see, the imagery again is really defined the look and feel of these sites here, in addition to the beautiful decanter standard Stanford branding um, that uh, we've uh, included here. Um, and so one thing that I learned while putting together this prototype is um, really thinking about your content and um, what we are technical term being chunkify your content um, so that uh, you've got like basically headlines and um, small uh, sub uh, sub headlines and like text and things like that. Um, the components that are being built in here really uh, appreciate having a little, a little bit amount of text and then you have that beautiful white space there as well. So let me click around here to see. Um, and of course the Sierras, they're just like beautiful. So the imagery really lends itself well um, in this. click into a, a basic page with, with the banner here. Um, yeah. All right. And then the next site is, um, is the Teach Anywhere site. And um, so this site uh, has come up very quickly and very fast. And I think it really um, proved um, out um, some of our goals um, for this product because it was spun up very, very quickly. And um, it also shows how our um, user base, if, they, if they're if they so inclined to do more things, um, they're able to do that um, through um, other tools within here. And so one of the things that they did was they added um, these cards here um, using, I believe, Layout Builder. And then um, was also able to throw up content super, super quickly. Um, and I thought this site was a nice site to show for a lot of content, a lot of text-based content here. So, yeah. Just gonna click through here. Um, there we go. Um, Cynthia, do you want to go on with best practices? Yeah, actually, if I take over the screen, then I'd yes. like to do a tour of what you actually get out of the box. Okay. Okay, and you're a co-host now, so we're good to go. Awesome. Okay. So I should be, let me know if you guys can see the screen. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, so I'm Cynthia Miharis. I'm a, a web producer for Stanford Web Services. And uh, what I'd like to do is really just take you on a tour of what do you get when you request a site? So. Right out of the box, you'll notice that um, it's got some content already in place for you. So you can see all of the different elements that you can create, uh, including that uh, top banner. There's some text areas, uh, a card, some more text areas, various different button styles, and some other content, and a footer. So you notice that the web login, if you're familiar with our Drupal 7 sites, it's moved down to the bottom. Uh, so let's log in. I'll take a look at the back end. Okay. 
So now that we're logged in, you can see all of the editing features. That's real, what's nice actually, um, if you're familiar with our Drupal 7 site, is that the home page, you can never really edit the home page because it was always a combination of placing blocks or placing things on the home page. So it was always a question that we got asked, how do I edit this on the home page? So now we can edit the home page along with every other page because they're all just one content type. Um, so you can see out of the box, there's several different pages. And I'll just run through, I did create a couple things just for our demo today. So research, resources, and Allison, you know, quickly showed that there's some sidebar navigation, but just placeholder. And if you were to get a new site, you could replace this content, use these if you needed a resources page or an about page, uh, and then edit that from there. So I'm going to do the home page and just show you the, the back end. Hey, Cynthia. Yes. I have a question from Linnea um, mm -hmm. Williams. She's asking if you could talk about um, the choice, uh, the, the choice of making links blue, even though Stanford's color is red. I'm answering that question uh, right now in the chat window. Oh. Do you want to say it out loud, David, just so everyone oh, okay. can hear that? That's a sure. good question. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm David Tom. I'm a manager of UX and design at Stanford Web Services. So the reason we went with blue instead of red is just to making sure that we are giving ourselves a chance to use red um, as a primary action color uh, and not overwhelm the pages with a sea of red links. Mm -hmm. The blue is also a little bit more goes back a long way as a standard link color. Yeah, just to point out, we're recording, so um, maybe best of questions were all uh, uh, answered on video, so we'll have them for posterity. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the question, Linnea. All right, let's go back in and edit. Okay. So like Sarah was saying, you know, we're all in the, the days of video games and dragging and dropping things. So you can see here that there are several different rows and various different, what they're calling paragraphs options that you can select. So if I wanted to edit any particular row, I could just click the edit button here. Or if I wanted to add a new row, I could do that here. If I add a new row, it's going to say drag and drop a paragraph. So I can decide what kind of paragraph I want to drop. And I just want, let's say, the text area. So I'm just going to drag and drop that. And I can start editing here. Uh, also in this interface, you can easily rearrange your page just by using the drop handles. Um, but a couple nice things here, if you, start, if you start getting a longer page, you notice that there's multiple different text areas. And I'm like, which text area was that? <laughs> so this is um, something that we just added. If I wanted to change the administrative level, um, label rather, I could just say that this is um, welcome text. And that way you can kind of distinguish which card or which banner, which text area that is and you can easily identify that on your page when you go in to edit. So that's a nice new feature. Um, also in here, there is, let's do a, a banner. So with any image type of a paragraph, the, the banner or the card, you can add media using this media button. And this is a nice new feature that we built for the Drupal 8 product is there are images already in place that you can select from, or you can choose to upload a new image and have that be available the next time you edit a page or add a new page. So it's, it's actually just your inventory or resource of images. So you don't have to upload the same image to every single page if you want to use it over and over again. Um, so let's just, choose an image, and there it is. There's various different fields. Uh, just 
Stanford. Hey, Cynthia, um, mm -hmm. Tori, Tori Lewis is asking if that's the same with files as well as images. Uh, yes. So I'll just show you that. Hang on a sec. And there's some discussion happening about accessibility and colors. I'll get back to that in a minute. Okay. So let me just save this so you can kind of see what I did here. I made some changes already to the home page. So at the bottom, we just added a quick text area thing and a new banner. And the question was adding a file. Yeah, the question was um, if files are also accessible through the media library throughout the site. Yeah, so let me just show you that. So I'll just add a new row. I believe it might be this. Oh no, that's just video. Uh, where was that? Oh, here we go. Okay. So in the text area, um, if you chose, let me just say that again, there's an icon here for, for media, basically. If you just click there, you'll have access to the media library. And here you can add files. So you'll have a series of files once you start adding those, PDF files or whatever, or add your new ones here in the same way that you would add an image or a video. Um, so I also added a video here, and then once you start adding multiple videos, you'll have a video library, just like you have an image library. And Tori says, thank you very much. Beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Oh, I don't want to insert that. Let's just get out of there. All righty. Um, some other things in here. Um, so we talked about deleting things, rearranging uh, paragraphs, adding new paragraphs. Let's talk about the menu. So let me actually go back. That's a nice new feature as well, if you're noticing that. I, I made some changes, and sometimes when you're making changes and you go back and you lose your work, you're like, oh no, I lost all the work I did. So we added this feature so that it says, do you really want to leave the page after you know you didn't save all your changes? And I'm like, yeah, let's do that. I'm sure. Um, so where was I going? <laughs> I totally forgot where I was going. Oh, um, oh yeah, menu structure. Let's see. So under resources, I've got several pages here with uh, a sidebar navigation. So if I go to one of these sub pages, I just want to show you how it looks in the menu and how easy it is to rearrange a menu. So there's a single text area thing, paragraph. Uh, there is my provide a menu link, which automatically takes the page title. And I selected that resources is the parent item. Once, if I actually, let me do a new page so we can do that again. But you can see that once I have these in here, I can easily rearrange my navigation, which you couldn't do before. So that's kind of a new feature. But let me create a new page so we can see what that looks like. All of uh, the content creation is up here in adding content. Right now there's a single content type, that basic page, but you can go ahead and pre-upload things like your images, files, videos, so that you have them in your library, and you can do that ahead of time. So I'm just gonna add a page, and we'll call this WebCamp. And 
I don't even need to add any content at this point. So I'm gonna go down here and say that I need, wanna add this to the menu. There's my title that's automatically generated and it's showing me the main menu right now. So I can see that here's my page and it said it's providing a menu link, but I wanna nest that, let's say in the about, or let's say resources, it's all resources. Once I choose the parent, you'll see that it, here's my link again, and I can say that I want this to show up at the very bottom of this sidebar navigation. So you just drag that into the location where you want it to be, and then save your page. So there it is. Of course, there's no content at this point, but. Hey, Sophia, you just. Oh, you might just, have just been about to ask my question. <laughs> Oh yeah, I was about to ask your question, go ahead. Um, is that the feature you were just showing where at the bottom of the page when you're editing, it shows all the section menu links and gives you the chance to reorder them there. Is that custom? Did you guys build that or is that out of the box with D8? It's something that we built for D8. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's out of the box. I would have to confirm that with our developers, but it's something that comes with our Stanford Sites D8. Got it, oh, I see, it, I see. I will also say though that we, we develop everything as open source. You're welcome to it. If it's helpful to your developers and it's something they'd like to integrate, you're more than welcome to grab it. That's really great to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of other questions in here. I see, um, oh, hold on, let's see. Da, da, da. Um, my friend Ryan is asking, is there a way to apply custom CSS? And um, someone gave him the answer, asset injector module for CSS and JavaScript, which is true, but not on the service. So if you're building a uh, Drupal 7 or a Drupal 8 website on your own, absolutely, we've used asset injector successfully. It's a pretty powerful little toolkit. This service that we're demonstrating is Stanford Sites is more of a managed content management system. So it's essentially managed, it's more of a walled garden. We give site owners lots of power tools, but Asset Injector is not a power tool that we're providing in the Drupal 8 service. So for right now, the service doesn't really offer site owner flexibility with color selection. It's version one. So we built a visual design and a theme that has a default out of the box color system that's really uh, tightly tuned for brand and accessibility standards. And we're not providing that Asset Injector capabilities just yet. But uh, coming pretty soon, we are supporting sub-theming. So that is something where um, we hope that site owners will be able to create sub-themes that give their uh, unique look and feel that they're going for, but still works with the base theme and everything stays in sync. We're gonna roll that out sort of slowly so that we can tune it just right and make sure we have the documentation and support ready to go. Um, but again, Asset Injector works great, just not on this service. Okay, Before thanks, Sarah. Um, any other questions out there before we move on? There's a there's a conversation happening about the accessibility of link colors. I don't know if you want to hold off on that one. Link colors? Yeah, there's a discussion about <clears throat> blue versus red, and um, if you made that choice because of accessibility, um, do you want to hold off until you're done with your your part of the presentation? Uh, sure. Actually, I'm going to get, since we're in here and um, I really was going to go back and talk about best practices, I will probably just use what's in here and talk about uh, best practices instead of going back to the slide deck in case any other questions come up. We're already okay. in the site. Um, and uh, just a quick time check. We have about 13 minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so when we talk about best practices, uh, of course, beautiful imagery makes a site beautiful, but also content, you know, being able to make content readable, uh, findable, scannable. Uh, we like to talk about chunking. I know Allison mentioned that, but chunking our content so that it is scannable and readable. I mean, that's just kind of the way that people read websites now, and it's very different from a book. Um, so you'll see here on our homepage, we've got things like headings. Let me actually go to a sub page. Uh, so some of the things that we like to incorporate in our text to make it scannable and easier on the eye is things like summary text, which you'll find in 
magazine articles and things where the first maybe one or two sentences is a little bit bigger and it introduces you to what you're going to read on the page. And after they've read that first one or two sentences, then the person can decide if they want to continue to read more. So that's what we're calling a summary. And um, we've got short, sweet paragraphs here, um, separated by headers. And best practice for headings is that we choose our heading based on the semantic order. So our page title is always going to be what we call a H1 or heading one. And then your next heading choice would be a heading two. Um, and then if you had content below that that you needed to uh, separate out by headings, you'd go to heading three, heading four, et cetera. Uh, it's not necessary, it's not a good idea to select your heading based on the size that you like. Uh, we want to keep it semantic so that way when your screen reader or if someone were to use a screen reader, they would jump from heading one to heading two, jump and read all the heading twos down your page. And if they're interested in that heading two, then they would jump in and read that content and you know any lower headings in that heading two section. Uh, so those are headings. Uh, let's see, any, I don't really have links here. So um, another big thing with uh, links is, of course, this is not the best example, but when we talk about links, we refer to them as call to actions. So when you have uh, an in, a link like this, it's actually better to say, you know, like, read more about the stipulum, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever is on that page, um, instead of just button, uh, because we want the person to know what they're going to see when they click on the link. So things like in your, in your body content, things like click here or here, just the word here, with that being the link, is really um, difficult for, uh, screen readers primarily and also for people scanning down you'll see that the, the links will stand out but the word here doesn't mean as much as you know maybe highlighting the entire sentence or a few words just to, to know what is here what does here mean uh, so those are some tips for links uh, let's see we talked about headings actually let me get in and show you some styles go to a page. Over here under sample content, um, it's nice to actually have bulleted lists. If you're talking about a, a bunch of things, it's always easier to scan and bullets or numbered lists. That's another best practice we have. So in the text area, just show you quickly, if I highlight over something, you can see that it's got a style attached to it. So depending on what I'm clicking on, it'll let me know that this is a heading to. Uh, there currently is no styles, but there are plenty of styles to choose from, including this is a new fun one, which we've seen in um, you know, magazine articles and things that drop the drop case. Is cool. So uh, you guys may notice that Cynthia is spending most of her time talking about uh, adding content and styling content because remember I said version one of the product is for basic site owners who have mostly content-based sites. So I, I'm monitoring chat and I see several questions that are very much um, site builder or developer centric. So thinking about two to three or four column layouts, um, migrating your assets that you've created with Asset Injector from a D7 service to a D8, that's not where this service is just yet. So remember that what we're showing you is what's out and what's built. It isn't necessarily what's on our roadmap yet. So our roadmap is moving towards adding structured content, adding more layout, pre-built layout options, um, and making it easier to use that drag, drag and drop function to put multiple content elements side by side. So you'll get that full width banner effect followed by, um, you know, a centered paragraph in a page. I see that's one question on there, or you'll be able to put uh, videos next to each other. That's just not where the product is yet. 
product development takes longer than a single website development because we have to design things and then test the heck out of it to make sure that all the creative use cases that you guys might come up with, they're going to perform well and are still going to be maintainable as we push out monthly upgrades. So um, be patient with us. We're, we're not necessarily, we don't have any devs on the channel, so we're not necessarily going to be able to answer all of the questions about um, site building and development. But I'm really excited that people are engaged and looking for this service to provide those kinds of features because that is definitely on our on our roadmap and we intend to expand it in that direction. There was one question from Patrick McMahon about our alert banners available. That was something we had to scramble to do in the last two weeks or so. Uh, it is something that we can place on any of the sites. We don't have it really built into the tool, but Decanter does have the right styles for it. And we have a little um, snippet of code we can drop on any website that provides the COVID-19 uh, alert banner at the top. So you'll see it on the Teach Anywhere site, for example. Um, I did want to point out, since we're running so low on time, I wanted to point out we do have a user guide, and the user guide does have release notes in it. So just last night, we pushed a release of new features and uh, security updates, and I was just checking and relieved to see that our release notes did publish as well. So when you guys get a chance, check out userguide.sites.stanford.edu, and you'll see uh, the release notes there. Um, Sharon and Tori wanted to know what is their list of modules that is not on the release notes, but it's a great idea and I'll make sure that it gets up there. So thanks for asking about that. All right, back to you, Cynthia. I just wanted to kind of run through some of the things that <clears throat> that I had talked about and I'll share these uh, slides in the um, session notes area so that you can come back to this. But uh, I covered most of them. I didn't talk about tables. I don't have an example of a table, but uh, you can kind of see, and this is an example I, I took from Linnea. Thank you, Linnea. <laughs> but um, there's really like, like a lot of print things that you want to, I find this a lot, when you have a Word document or something in print that you want to translate to the web and you want to make it look pretty. And the web, um, things on the web are not necessarily laid out the same way as you would lay out a print piece of print, you know, work. So things like this, the list of various different locations, I'm guessing, um, it's not necessarily a table. So tables are really uh, something that's tabular data. And I would say that this is a table because it's definitely got something like a, a heading, you know, there's various different headers and tables will always have either a heading or um, <clears throat> a heading on the top or on the side. What other things, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, last thing here I just wanted to talk about is that websites are, we call like a garden. And gardens always need to be pruned, things need to be trimmed, things need to be planted. Uh, so don't let your content die. You know, there's really, uh, once it's, once you launch a site, you always want to revisit that, make sure your content's still relevant, adding new things, adding new images, and you might want to just consider maybe just sort of either an annual review or however it makes sense, maybe quarterly, just to review all of your content. Um, some people have uh, found that if you actually put it on your calendar or have a team of people that you work with that say this is going to be our web team and we're going to take you know just kind of commit to taking a look at your website and making sure it's still relevant and up to date uh, so that it stays fresh. Okay so this is uh, some of the resources that Sarah mentioned and uh, including how to get your D8 site and some blog articles and Etc. But I want to leave the last few minutes for questions. Here's some contact information and thank you. Yes, yeah, so I guess we'll leave it open to questions. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, we have about four minutes. So feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or type it into the chat and I'll read it out. I also included a link to the slide deck in the chat too, so you can click on the links that we've been talking about. <laughs> Oh yeah, I also included a link to the, the guide, the user guide. 
Awesome. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, that is, that's version one of our user guide. Everything we do is, uh, is open source. If anybody would like to make contributions, including to our user guide, if you figure out something cool to do on the service and you're like, this isn't in the user guide, feel free to write that up. Send it on over. <laughs> And this is the free service that's available to anyone at the university. Yeah, this yeah. this content management system. So we say that here's the link for how to get a D8 site. That is for uh, members of the Stanford community with the SendNet ID. So it's unfortunately not going to be available to any members of the public who might have joined us today. But you can definitely read all about it. The user guide is publicly viewable, and we'd love to take questions and share it, especially with others, uh, other universities who may be on the call. Oh, yeah, Sarah, if Stanford uh, people want to create a site, where do they go to request one? They go to sites.stanford.edu. It's going to give you a, a menu of information there because right now you can still choose between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. We have not turned off the ability to install a Drupal 7 site because that's still very feature rich and it has not reached end of life yet. So once we are slightly more at parity on the D8 service, we'll probably shut down that um, the ability to create a new Drupal 7 site on that service. But for now, sites.stanford.edu, you can make a choice there. There's a little guide that helps you which choice to make. And then you're off and running. Also in the user guide, I have a link on the resources page. It says, how do I request a D8 site? So it does tell you specifically some instructions when you're requesting that in ServiceNow. The other thing to mention is we did write uh, an adoption toolkit Sometimes it, you don't want to jump into building the site. You want to first plan your project, it, particularly at a university where we all work in groups. We have stakeholders. We have content owners in different units. You really want to think about this as a project. So uh, Dina and David led an effort over the last several months. I'm pointing at them because I see them on my screen. I don't know if you guys do. But uh, my colleagues, Dina DeBry, our web strategist, and David Tom, our manager of UX and design, work together to create an, an adoption toolkit with some great things to help plan your project. So there's a project template there, there's a project budget template there, there's questions to help you think about how to do a content audit and discover what's ready to move, what needs some editing. So there's lots of things that you and your colleagues can be doing if you have a Drupal 7 site that's uh, ready to move forward into Drupal 8 before you ever sit down and start site building. But I want to just thank everybody for attending and for sharing your really thoughtful questions uh, and for giving us a chance to get out a great service. And hopefully you'll be able to use it, give us your feedback, send in your tickets, because all of your ideas, things that you're asking for, they do make it into our regular weekly team meetings and we talk about them and bring it forward to uh, consider for the next release. So keep those ideas coming and I look forward to seeing some beautiful new Stanford branded websites coming up soon. All right, thanks everybody. That's it, thanks Thank everybody. You.